Hey everybody, it's Dave Hall, uh, Alabama Sasquatch, and I'm bringing you another one of my uh, deep talks with the Alabama Sasquatch. And today I am so excited to have probably one of my oldest mentors. Um, he may not even realize that uh, uh, he actually kind of launched my career outside that's, of- That's uh, ridiculous, uh, Dave. <laughs> I don't believe you. I don't believe <laughs> no, you. No, it's actually true uh, because I actually started my career working on uh, the personal training side of Lakeview Personal Fitness, and it was all universal stacks and cable cross and um, very limited uh, uh, um, hammer strength machines. So all just like, I mean, that's, that's where I got thrown into the pool, and so that's where I was swimming. And I started getting interested in kettlebells, and that's how I found you, actually was uh, I actually have uh, the DVD that you and Zach Avanesh put out together. Uh, looks like maybe in your backyard or maybe in Zach's, it's Zach's backyard. backyard. <laughs> Zach's backyard. What is old Pitbull Arnold? That's right. Yes. His so, Pitbull was named Arnold after Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course. <laughs> of course. Right. So uh, uh, I am so excited to, uh, uh, to get you on the line again and to be able to bend your ear and uh, listen to you. Um, so yeah, man. everybody, this is Jason C. Brown. Thank um, you for having me, Dave. Appreciate dude, it. I am so, like I said, I'm so thrilled that you're here. Um, so let's just dive into it. So already, you know, before we even started recording, uh, you've, you know, you've totally blown me away with two new devices um, that I didn't even know existed. Uh, well, can you talk I'm, me out of, can you, Dave, do me a favor. Can I talk you out of it? <laughs> can you talk me out of ordering more? My wife will, if she sees those 12 heavy boxes on their front porch, it may be cause for divorce. Okay. Well, so, uh, um, talk me, talk to me about the device. I mean, so basically what we're talking about is a, uh, uh, is, is a weight with a handle in the center of it, but instead yes. of a dumbbell, it actually is distributed all the way around the hand. So yes. it's almost like, uh, um, yeah, show it. Cause that's, so there's a few different versions and before the two main companies that put this out, Dave is Sora next mm -hmm. and, uh, rogue fitness and the person mostly responsible for this right now is Donnie Thompson, the world famous power lifter, right? Mm -hmm. So rogue calls them fat bells. I think that's Donnie's term. And then sore next calls them center mass bells because the mass is centered on your hand, but the, I'll just show it. But there were previous versions of these weights available before Donnie Thompson and these two companies put them out, but they're called like J weights or J. Uh -huh. I can send links to everything, Dave, because, you know, like you and Chip, sort of a historian into this type right, of stuff. For sure. But this is the center mass bell. This is a 20 pounder. Dave's going to talk me out of getting the whole set <laughs> up to 350, which will cost me $4,000. No, I made that up. I would never order that. But this is a 20 pounder. And if you can see, it's a, it's a sphere, yeah, but it has a flat, a flat edge. So you can set it on either side and it is open. So that the handle's on the center. Okay. And your hand, your palm is centered. So the Sornax term center mass bell right. is pretty applicable, right? And you can press with it. Here, I'm leaning back. My form sucks, but, right? Yeah. This is only a 20 pound, but the stimulus it provides is very nice. And again, the Sornax ones are open. So you can do cool little like uh, two handed presses. Right. If like the 20, I'm strong enough to handle the 20 single arm. But if some people are not, you can press very comfortably right. here. You can do palm presses quite well. Works very nice. I'm trying to get a good angle here for a pinch grip. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. So it works very well for a pinch grip. Three, two, I do swings like this sometimes. Works super well. Oh, wow. It's just super, it's really versatile. You can deadlift with them well using the handle. You can deadlift with, with them well using this type of grip, two-handed, goblet squats. It's actually an easier, I know you're not supposed to talk about things being easy when you're talking about exercise, but they're a much easier tool for most people to navigate than even the pure, the kettlebell purist and the lover of the kettlebells like you and I are. These I think are actually, and dare I say it, a better option for most individuals. Yeah. 
because you just don't get this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It, it, it's obvious that you can do basically all the same movements, but the, there's it shortens that learning curve of yes. how to manipulate, which for a lot, especially like your Gen Pop clients, like they don't care. They don't really, that's not they what don't they're care. there for. So, you know, they don't making care. it more complicated is more of a turnoff for them. I agree. So, yeah. The cool kettlebell stuff that we do, that's, that's honestly, Dave, and you and I have been in this field for a long time. It's uh it's there to impress the other coach. It's there to impress the other trainer. It's right. not necessarily, it's not there to impress your gen pop, fat loss, muscle right. mass, even bodybuilders. Like, yeah, they it's, don't need uh, these. Uh, so I've got uh, a quote on my board from William of Ockham. It is vain to do with more what can be done with less. Perfect. And that's you know that's exactly what it is. Is that it just comes down to our vanity and impressing each other with complicated tools and complicated movement patterns that our clients really aren't so interested in. What's the first name? Uh, William of Ockham. It's Ockham. Yes. The guy. The Ockham's. Ockham's Razor. razor. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And uh, that's a great um, quote. That's a great quote. Well, so and. So what I love about you and what I love about your work is that you are an artist. You're an artist first and foremost. I'm and a suffering artist, Dave. It's hard. <laughs> Which is the very I feel like an art. artist, but I don't do shit. So I don't feel, uh, you know. Well, I mean, so first off, have you ever met a happy artist? If so, they're, you know. Do you know like, Stephen Pressfield? You like Stephen Pressfield, I mean, right? Yeah, I love Stephen Pressfield. So yeah. Stephen Pressfield is, he has many books, you know, The right. Artist Way. No, I'm sorry. That's Julia Cameron. Artist Journey is Stephen Pressfield. Then The Art of Work, right? And all that stuff. Right. And he's, uh, he was also a Marine. And he says, the Marines, one of the most valuable things the Marines teach you is how to suffer. And <laughs> suffering is invaluable for the artist, right? Yes. Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I've met happy artists. I think it's a struggle to make good money unless you're like the red hot chili peppers, but I'm sure yes. they struggled quite well. Oh yeah, totally. In you the know, beginning and, also. And, you know, I think it's also, there is, I mean, you can make the argument that life itself is inherently suffering and, and whether that breaks you down or builds you up is how you, how you meet that suffering. And it's very Buddhist thing. So yeah, well, thanks. You know, you can tell with the redneck and, and uh, <laughs> the, redneck, the redneck Buddhist. That's your next. That's your next tagline. <laughs> there you go. Right. Um, but I think that's actually really legit. You know, because um, the more you, the more you run away from pain, right, the harder it chases you. That if you can stop and turn around and actually look at it you know, it still sucks. It still hurts. It's going to hurt. It's pain. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't have the same hold on you the way that it does when you're actively trying to get away from it. I agree. Totally. Um, and, you know, and getting back to you, I think that you have a very, everything about your work is very creative. Everything you do is outside the box. Like, I mean, just the, that fusion between kettlebell and dumbbell, right? Um, a lot of people would look at that and go, especially a lot of us who have been steeped in the industry, um, who, you know, are like, you know, okay, so we had the dumbbell and we understand the dumbbell and we made the transition to the kettlebell, but like, what the hell do I do with this thing? Right. right. And, right. you know, having worked with you and, and knowing how easily you slip the bonds of, um, of parameters of, of like the conventional box that most of us live in. Um, I bet, I bet that's really cool. You know, the clients are very lucky. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's not an easy existence. No, it's no. not. But Did, do, you know, honestly, that tell me honestly, honestly, what? full on from the heart of Jason C. Brown. Yeah. Would you want it any other way? Would you really, really want it any no, other way? But I, that's a great question, Dave. And I don't think you could have it any other way because yeah. like, I think there's clues and that are given to us throughout our entire life, right? 
And if, if two things have always fascinated me, it's been, I'm going to use the term natural movement. So movement, right? Training, martial arts. I mean, since I was six, I can remember fantasizing and, and, and imagining these things, but also art because I was a heavy drawler when I was young. My mom yeah. was an x-ray technician and she would bring home these x-ray, uh, these, it was sort of like a thinner cardboard, but she would just get these boxes of this cardboard and that was my drawing canvas for years. Oh, wow. And in high school, I went to, to uh, a vocational school. I don't know what they're called now. Maybe still vocational school, but I went to a vocational school uh, in art school. So oh. movement training, warrior type of stuff and arts have always been there. Right. Yeah. So I, I think it's not an active choosing. And I think if we spoke to anyone about what they're doing for a living or what they enjoy doing, I think they will say that they've had clues their entire life. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think especially anybody who is, dare I use the word genuine? Yeah. Like, I mean, I know a lot of people who have followed a path in life and, and plotted a course, um, but it's not their genuine course. Yes. You know, so that there's a lot of unhappiness there trying to force themselves into a mold that's not really their path. Right. Um, and as a parent, Dave, you know, you're, you're a father yeah. it's a, and, and your girls have gone to college. Right. And as a father, you want to offer some guidance and guidance and perhaps direction. But, you know, why don't you study this? Why don't you study that? <laughs> and your child has absolutely zero inclination. Right. And you think, yeah. you know, your child, but I heard this. A cool, I don't know who said this, Dave but I use it all the time when discussing schools with my wife. You can be whatever you want when you grow up, son, except yourself. That's, that's deep, right? I don't know yeah. who said that, but we as parents, we tried to, you gave, you turned me on to that great book, Simplicity Parenting. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he talks to Gardner. I think that's right. He talks yeah. about Gardner, counselor. He uses three different things in there. And uh, oh, my shed door just slammed, Dave. Now I look, I look <laughs> like a, Jocko Willink. A mood shift. <laughs> yes. Get some. Let me look. Do it. Good. Um, but it's true. I think a lot of people are uh, um, led in that direction that is not necessarily genuine or authentic, like you said, right? Yeah. And sometimes I think I, I was fortunate to have parents that did not offer any direction. And I did absolutely whatever I wanted. And uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's fascinating to me because like what I know of your background, you know, straight edge. Um, are you still vegetarian? You I'm not. A long time. Okay. I'm not um, over 20 years, but I am not anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so, but a very straight edge, vegetarian lifestyle. Is Chip uh, still uh, vegan? Uh, well, Chip's never been vegan, but oh, okay. uh, uh, he is vegetarian. Yeah, he still, he still maintains that. Okay. Um, but then, like, and you, you were in a straight edge band. Yes. So, so a punk rock metal band. That was in high school, right? After high school, after, well, no, no, in high school, yes. But the majority of it came after, actually, after the Marines. Okay, all right. So that's yeah. what I was trying to figure out chronologically was like, but then, yeah, so there's, there's this straight edge punk rock element that then went into the Marine Corps, which yeah. seems completely antithetical. Nuts, Dave. Nuts. I tell that to my boy. I really hope my sons don't drink Yeah. or do any, any substances. I'd be all right with pot, maybe. But... um. I made it through the Marines without having one drink. Yeah. If you can do that, right? <laughs> but, but the other Marines respected me for it. I was actually a vegetarian in the Marines as well. Yeah. And they respected me for that. And they were always willing to like, you don't want that, to, that spaghetti with meat sauce? 
I'll trade you that spaghetti for meat with meat <laughs> sauce for something like vegetarian. And they were always, always respectful about it. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, you can't help but have respect for that. Like, you know how hard it is for you, you know, just doing the normal thing. And then to watch Jason come in as an outlier and, and hang with everybody. I mean, it's, it's almost mythic, right? Yeah. I'm sure that the stories that were told about you and continue to be told about you from uh, uh, your, your fellow Marines has got to be you know, mythic. <laughs> I, I, I'm not so sure, Dave. There was a, so there was a, a few uh, uh, Muslims in my platoon. Yeah. Specifically, black Muslims that I think they they differ a little bit philosophically from like a uh, an Arab Muslim or a Middle Eastern Muslim. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I don't know all of the details, but they were vegetarian. Okay. So there was a few of us. Like I was just a vegetarian because I come from more of an Eastern minded type of uh, approach. Yeah. And they were vegetarian because of their uh, Islamic faith. Now I'm not sure if that's true for all Muslims, but that's their particular strain of. Uh, mm -hmm. Islam, they were vegetarian. So we, we got along and we would compare notes and we would actually, sh we would get the Bible and we would show all the Southern Christians where it says to be a vegetarian in the Bible <laughs> and they wouldn't believe it, but we did our best. <laughs> so were you a martial artist in high school? No, the, the, unfortunately my town had zero. Uh, so that didn't start until after the Marine Corps. I, I pretended to be a ninja and do karate. There was karate. There was karate at this little, Dave, it was horrible. Like no, nobody in their right mind would have signed up for this karate spot. <laughs> and then one of the karate kids got torn up at lunchtime by a kid that never did anything. And any, yeah. any hope of that karate school doing well was just was crushed just right gone. there on the playground. Yeah. Uh, and then most of the, the kids where I grew up were, there was a good, there's a strong wrestling culture and there's a strong football culture. And those kids were the tough kids. Right. But around the time where I was growing up also, there was this, the BMX culture and skate mm -hmm. culture was pretty big. And uh, I gravitated towards the BMX and the skater kids. And again, there were no martial arts, but we trained pretty heavily. Like the skaters and the BMX kids, we were just as strong and fast as the, the jocks. Yeah. And if well, we weren't jocks, you were just cool jocks. Yes, we were just cool jocks. You know, I always <laughs> talk about that, Dave. I'm like, look, it, if we go to a basketball court, I can sink free, free throws, right? I yeah. can make shots. I can sink buckets or whatever yeah. they say. You're, if we get on a 20-inch bike, you're not going to do what I no. do. No. You're not, right? <laughs> no, not at all. So yeah. it drives me nuts that these these traditional sports are considered like the, the pinnacle of, of, of athleticism. They're not. No. The X Games, the, uh, the, yeah. the parkour athletes, the, yeah. the martial arts players, these are the, they're the real athletes. I shouldn't say that. I mean, if you get in a fight with a good American football player, you're, you're going to get fucked up. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, true. Like, you know, just because, and not so much from a skill perspective, but just because those guys are used to getting hit. Yes. They're used to taking punishment. And it's, it's true. Part of what they do all day, every day. And so, you know, yeah. Um, and they're just physical. Yes. You know, they're not they're afraid of being physical. physical. Actually, uh, uh, one of my jujitsu brothers, um, believe it or not, I'm not the biggest guy in my class. Um, and so one of my brothers, um, I am close to the oldest guy in my class, though. So that is humbling. Who's older, Bob? Uh, actually, I don't train with Bob. Bob trains okay. at uh, a different school. But uh, um, no, I'm actually, I'm older than my professor by... Uh, four or five years, I think. I yep. think he's 45, 46. I turned 50 this year. Um, there's one other guy um, who's a couple of years older than me, 51, 52. Um, but uh, uh, most of the guys that I train with, because it's the South, have at least some level of uh, um, a football background. But uh, um, the one guy that I'm thinking about, thinking about you, Will Leesburg, um, he's – early thirties, uh, played, uh, played in college. Um, he's 
310, 315, and he's fast. And that's not fair. You should right. not be fast and that big. <laughs> right. I know. It's just not fair. Yeah. Those are the guys I avoid. <laughs> Dave, you, you want to train with that guy? <laughs> yeah, you get, you train with him, Dave. That's right. For sure. Um, so, so I'm insanely curious, and I feel like we've danced around this conversation before, but I'm going for the hardcore. Um, I want to know why. Um, yeah. Why'd you become a Marine? What, what would, what Why would become make, a what? A Marine. Why'd you make that Oh, choice? a Marine? Oh, because I, uh, I've always wanted to be a warrior. And nice. okay. uh, maybe there are better options now, but at, at my, in my view in high school, the best option to become a warrior, an elite wa warrior was to go into the world's best fighting unit. Yeah. And that was the Marines at the time, of course, excluding special forces of other branches and stuff like that. Okay. But um, I thought that was the, the best option at the time. So um, what was that drive? What, uh, uh, so like, I mean, I grew up watching David Carradine uh, on yeah. Kung Fu. I grew up watching, um, you know, action theater on my local independent station. So I watched all of the, uh, and I still have an extensive library of, of chop sake films. And, um, but um, I wanted to be a martial artist. Yes. But I never had the drive to be like, it never crossed my mind at that point in my life as a young teenager or, you know, as a young adult to consider military service. Yes. Um, so what was, what was, what's the difference between you and me? Cause we're very similar in many ways, but like that, that's a, that's a huge commitment. And that's yeah. like, I have a tremendous amount of respect for that. Like maybe that, you had more direction when you were 17. Than <laughs> I never college at that time, never called to me. Yeah. Unfortunately, now as as a father, and uh, as somebody that's older, I we change, right? Trades didn't call to me. Yeah. College didn't call to me. There was only, I mean, what are you going to do when you're 18? Yeah. You're going to get a retail job? I mean, I had a retail job. I made $5.10 yeah. an hour. Right, you would work all day and come home with forty dollars, <laughs> right? Yeah. So uh, retail was was not going to pay the bills, right? Yeah. I wanted some type of warrior esque training. Uh, college did a call to me, and if I, to be honest, if I would have gone to college when I was eighteen, it would have been a waste of money and a waste of time. I would have picked something like you were saying earlier that was not genuine. I would yeah. have studied some bullshit like fucking accounting or some shit and hated it. Right. I don't know yeah. what I would study, but I'm glad was, I did. I'm glad I didn't do it. Yeah, that was certainly my path. I uh, uh, I went to college straight out of high school because that's what I was told I was supposed to do. Yeah. And uh, um, I pursued a degree in history, not particularly because I had a passion for history, but because it was a liberal arts degree. And I was told that that would make me the most well-rounded well -rounded and, and, and therefore employable person with yeah. a college degree when I came out. Now, unfortunately, what a scam. oh yeah, what totally. a scam. Like, you know, yeah. And I think that's They actually, wanted your tuition, Dave. They just wanted your tuition. 100%. Like, yeah. I remember, like- Don't I get actually, me wrong. Marines lie to you too, but colleges oh, yeah. lie to you as well. Well, that's just it, is like everybody lies to teenagers. Yes, right? yes. Everybody lies to teenagers because they want to, they're not so much interested in what is in your best interest. I literally, I was like second quarter uh, senior, like I was two quarters away from graduating and a professor in what was an elective class for me in American studies was suddenly like, you know, you should become an American studies major you're really good at this and blah, 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 blah. You know, and I looked at him and I was like, dude, I'm two quarters away from graduating. You don't care about what's in my best interest. You got a new department and you're trying to fill your department. That's what you want. 
right? And I just, I became very disenchanted and, you know, I was, I was having a bit of an existential crisis in terms of about to graduate from college and had no knowledge of what was next. I had, right. I had, you know. Yeah, man, what are you going to do with a history degree, Dave? Three and a half years of college. You I mean, study weightlifting history, Dave. You study <laughs> physical culture. That's what you do, man. Right? Yeah. Right? You know, so that I can write books for the five people who read about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Um, yeah, and, and like if I were to go back and advise myself now, um, I think I would have told myself, well, I would have told myself what I told my daughters. It's like, figure out what you want first, right? Unfortunately, it's a tough thing, man. It's a oh, tough it thing is. at that age, isn't it? It is. It's a terrible. Yeah, exactly. Which is the second thing that follows that up is you don't have to decide now. Right. Right. Like right. my youngest daughter who just moved out, Dahlia just moved out like a couple weeks ago. Um, she graduated early from, uh, uh, from school. She did what, like you, she did an arts program. Um, and she's insanely talented, but you know, was pretty sure she didn't want to go to college. I wasn't, yeah. she, you know, she was like, I don't really have an interest in doing that. And I was like, you know what? It's totally fine. Here's the deal, right? If you're in school, you can live here rent free. I'll take care of you, right? If you're not in school, you're gonna have to get a job. I don't care what it is, but you're gonna have to contribute to the house, right? You know, and and she was cool with that, and she did that, and 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 my thinking along those lines is that you got to get out and you got to do something, right? And since you don't have an idea, and and you shouldn't, no, very only a very few number of people like are gifted with that. I knew from the time that I was five years old that I wanted to be a doctor, right? Right. But, you know, the rest of us are just kind of like figuring shit out. And still, so spend, man, still at our age, right? Midlife. Spend what the hell? Time right? figuring out what you don't like. Go do shit. Go do shit that you have the slightest inclination. Oh, that looks interesting. I think the I don't like, that. Dave, I think the don't like, like you just said, is probably more important than the do like. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right? Like, because that I, way you can cut away, like, oh, I went and did, you know, <clears throat> I did a bunch of different trades. I did, I actually enjoyed cooking. I really yeah. enjoyed cooking. You're a good but, cook, too. Well, thank you. But yeah. what I didn't like about being a chef was how it limited my ability to be available for my family. And so that was too high of a cost for me. So I was like, okay, if that's what's required for this, that's off the table. I'll get that in by cooking for my family and my friends and entertaining and doing things like that. But I don't have to, I don't have to pursue this career because that's not the path for me. So it, it, you know, and so I can take that off the table and I can see what's left and go, okay, well, what if I go in this direction, right? And eventually those do not, you know, don't like that, don't like that led me to where I am now. And I found this thing that I was like, oh shit, I really do like that. And, right. And so that, you know, then draws me forward and, and, you know, the path is constantly changing. It's true. The ground yeah. is constantly changing. Yes, you know, it's I mean, true, man. Part of the reason that I'm putting this building behind the house was that for two months I was told I couldn't work. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh no, wait a minute, that's not cool, right? I, I can't, I can't do that." So, like, how can I, how can I get around that? So, anyway, yeah, I, I, I think that's really important. It's interesting that you said you, you couldn't work, so you did something on your property. I was just discussing this with my – actually, I did the Instagram post about it last week, too. I saw that. I know that urban going. gardener who said yeah, people who work all day long, they work for their homes or they work for their property or they work for their house instead of having their property work for them. Yeah. Now, he was specifically speaking about gardening and having some type of vegetable situation or fruit trees, like at least something that produces 
instead of you having an expense of maintaining a lawn or the expense of maintaining a house, can you have a cool little property such as Emerson Acres, right? right? Where it makes you money, where the property works for you, man. That's just the old school way it was. You had right. properties so you could work the land and the land would work for you. Yeah. Right. Now we go to a whole nother place. There's people that are working 12 hour days. They're not even in their home for 12 hours, but that's why they're working so hard. Yeah. So, so they can come home and pass out on that bed every night. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Have a place to go to go be unconscious in. Yes. Yeah. To zone out for eight to 12 hours. Whereas, you know, maybe you don't have to have that $400 Trader Joe's bill. Right. If you, grow your own Swiss chard once in a while, yeah. right? Or you have a, a few of, some of my neighbors have ducks. They get 11 yeah. eggs every day. Yeah. 11 eggs every day. Yeah, duck eggs some of those eggs. Awesome. Give me, they are. Give me some of those duck eggs. <laughs> Seriously. Unfortunately, the local foxes have a, a good time. Right. But yeah. Yeah, I thought about that. I, I'm, I'm glad you built that on that property. Dave. We're going to have to, on your property, we're going to have to come down and do some. Uh, Absolutely. Live 100%. Events. So one of the. Uh, Only uh, if the goats are there. The are goats the goats are still, still there? The goats, they're still there. Okay. They're still there. All right. Um, so one of the, uh, one of the advantages of being an empty nester and, and, you know, and living, living in a place where property is relatively cheap. Yeah. You know, and, and you've been to my house. And so yeah. by, you know, by national standards, I've got a big house. I got a big house and, and I got room and now my kids are out and I have the space. And so I'm toying with the idea of a, uh, I'm going to call it a barbell B and B. Yes. And so that I can bring, um, you know, people, like I know some you, people that do that. Well, Dave, you know, who can come down and, and, uh, um, you know, stay, uh, we'll use the gym, you know, it's, it's an opportunity, perhaps, you know, you could come down and we could spend a couple of days and we could shoot a, uh, a, a tutorial, right. And then, and now you've got a product that you can turn around and put back out there. And, you know, and I have the opportunity to spend two days with my friend and, and that I don't get to see all the time. I'm not coming down in the summer, Dave. No, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> What's Alabama like in the summer? Brutal. <laughs> It's hot. Okay, so uh, you better have fans in that place, Dave. I will. I will. You and I, <laughs> you and I share a passion for. Uh, uh, you went down to. Uh, uh, do you still go down to Tulum? You guys went down to Mexico. Uh, we were north of Tulum. I was never in Tulum. Um, Acumal. Acumal, yes. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, Samantha and I, uh, for our anniversary in 2019, went to Merida. Uh, Merida is on the northern side of the Yucatan Peninsula. Yes. Sort of the hub for a lot of the Mayan ruins in that area. Yep. And um, absolutely fell in love. I was, <laughs> I came home and I was looking at properties. I was like, there's a big we... expat community. Oh, there's there. a huge expat community there. It's, yeah. it's rather remarkable. Um, but the temperatures there, it's 90 degrees year round, right? And it was so funny because I had found a, a, a jujitsu school to train with while I was there. And uh, some of the guys were like, so, you know, how are you handling the heat? And I'm like, honestly, it's about the same as an Alabama summer. You know, it's yeah. 90 something degrees and it's humid as fuck. It's, yeah. you know, so, you know, I'm like, what's it like in December? They're like, it's 90 something degrees and it's humid as fuck. I'm like, okay, so you got an Alabama Well, it's December summer. like in Alabama. Um, it actually gets, we don't get quite as cold as you guys get. Yeah. Um, we get I've, minus zero sometimes, Dave. Yeah. we. It's been years since we've gotten below zero. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we'll have a couple of weeks where it's, you know, below freezing at night. Um, but That's good. Most I'll come the down time, then. I'll come down yeah. then. All right. Most of the time it's 40s, 50s. <laughs> Um, we might even, you know, December, it might even jump back up to 60 degrees. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, you would find it to be uh, quite comfortable, actually. Okay, I'll come down then. That's the time to come down. 
All right. <laughs> You'll still have to put the fans on, though. Hey, you know what? I will have them available <laughs> just for you. We'll be moving and stuff anyways, man. I'll so wear a sweater nice under my gear, so it'll be okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, I haven't spoken to you directly since this happened, but congratulations on your black belt. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, that's a huge accomplishment. That's, that's a big thing, dude. Thank you. So, uh, uh, like, do you wear it to the mall? No. <laughs> <laughs> do you have, hey. Just, just the, just the dinner dates. Have you just seen, have, have you seen the street belt that, uh, uh, that looks like a black belt? I have. <laughs> Please don't. I, I hope nobody actually wears that. I hope nobody actually wears that. We the were, most acceptable thing would be the paracord bracelet. Right. Have you seen those? I have. I've seen yeah, those. That, that's okay. Yeah. Those are okay. Yeah. But the belts, no. <laughs> At least for me. Yeah. I get it. I totally get it for sure. Um, you know, when I got my blue belt, we joked about uh, wearing it to the grocery store, though. So, uh, uh. <laughs> right. I can't, there's people that walk, to, show up to class in their gi and I'm like, why, how do you, <laughs> you change at the gym? Yeah. You change at the gym, but yeah. I don't know. No, I get that for sure. And, uh, uh, although honestly, I'm actually guilty of that, uh, simply because I have a 6 a.m. class. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't you train have, at 6 a.m. I do. Um, I don't I don't wear, you know, I don't tie my gi belt and, and walk in and wear my jacket, you know, and, and belt. But, uh, uh, I'm, you know, it's from the house to the gym, train, and then right back to the house. Good man. So, yeah, it's, uh, um, it's how it works. Um, I've been, my professor has been very kind uh, and, and supportive of me. And, and so he, I have a, I have a white belt class that I teach at my gym. Um, and so that gets it. Honestly, it's extra training time for me to be honest. Yeah. You know, it's that gift that you have of uh, being able to teach helps solidify the knowledge that you yes. already, that you've gotten. Like I learned so much more trying to explain concepts um, to other people. It's, it's, you know, it just solidifies that knowledge. Yeah, there's no better way to, to right? learn and to teach. Totally yeah. agree. Yeah. That's what makes the Montessori approach to education so cool. The fourth mm -hmm. graders help the third graders. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a fundamental. How old are your boys now? I'm just going to jump around. 17, topics, 17, 13, and eight. Wow. Yeah. So, and you have boys. So what's it like having a 17 year old son? I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little more understanding of the situation than let's say the, the, my, my wife. Got you. I think it's, I think because I was once a 17 year old boy. Right. Yeah. I understand 17 year old boy energy. Yeah. And he doesn't really have an attitude, but I, I can understand the male energy and attitudes much better than, than my, my wife, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's sort of undecided about his future. So was I at 17. Of course. My wife, Jennifer, she was, she knew that she wanted to be an engineer at that time. So she's one of those individuals that you and I were speaking about. Like she had yeah. a clear boom. This is what I want to do. She turned 18, went to college for engineering. She knew, but when I was 17, my, his name is Angelo. I, I, I can see much of my history in his current situation, right? right? Like messy room drives me nuts. Yeah. Right. But the messy room, I understand because my room was messy when I was 17. Yeah. Right. One in the be outside all the time with my boys. Like he, if he could stay out till two in the morning, he would. Mm -hmm. Right. He was a BMX kid. So a lot of his life was my life and I understand his energy and, and his, his drive to do things. So I love it. I love having a 13 year old boy too. I, you know, maybe it's crude and maybe it's ridiculous, but I understand boy humor, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Hey, let's go play with the balls. I'm talking tennis balls, but they get a kick out of the yeah, like, like, ball. <laughs> yeah. Right. The beavis, stupid beavis and butthead type of stuff. Right. 
So I understand that more than maybe some individuals. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't mind it at all. I don't mind it at all. And I know some fathers, and maybe I was this way with my father, a lot of uh, boys do have some weird energy with their fathers growing up, like maybe like a dominance type of thing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I don't have that with my sons. Thank God. But I, I do understand that that can be a concern with some people. Do they train martial arts? Do they train jujitsu? They have all trained at some point in their lives. My eight year old has recently with COVID, it got super. First of all, we right. had to take a yeah. few months off. But he was doing kickboxing and grappling. They call it grappling. They didn't call it jujitsu, but it was jujitsu based. And uh, when we did come back, there was no touching. Yeah. It was just heavy bag work. And it was totally boring. Like they had a, you know, there was no interaction. There was no, like to use a martial arts term, there was no aliveness. Right. Right. Yeah. There was like, and he's eight. You can only, an eight year old can only hit a heavy bag for so many hours before he's right. like, Dad, I'm bored. This is dumb. Yeah. yeah. But when there was partner work, he loved it. When there was partner grappling, he loved it. When they could actually shadow box with one another and, and use their movement, their rhythm, and their timing, it was great. But he, he asked to quit. So I granted him that uh, I'm not that type of dad, right? Like, I yeah, thought I'm not forcing you to play sports. You don't want to play lacrosse anymore? No. Don't play lacrosse. You have to be active. You're not going to sit in your room all day on video games because I love you. You're not going to sit on your, <laughs> on your right? Yeah. But I don't care what activity you choose. It could be BMX, it could be skateboard, swimming, whatever. I don't care. Just be active. Yeah. Yeah, I took a similar tact with my daughters. The last thing I wanted was for them. The last thing I wanted was for them to hate the gym. Yeah. And so, like, I never made it mandatory. Um, if they had a desire to come in and they all did at different times and they all did different things. Um, and so, you know, I was, I made it available for them and said, yep. And as soon as their interest went to something else, no big deal. Um, you know, and it's I, good for them to be well rounded. Yeah, of course. Right. Like my oldest one has done gymnastics. He's a great swimmer, skateboarder, BMX, capoeira, jujitsu, judo. And it, it, it's, it's what childhood should have been, right? It's like, instead of yeah. these kids that have been specializing since they are four oh, God. and then yeah. they get to 14 and they're like, I'm done. I'm not doing anything. Well, that's because yeah. dad made you do yeah. soccer since you were four. Yeah. Right. And you and I know, right, as physical educators, it's the multi, to use a fancy term, it's the multilateral development, which is truly developmental, right? Yeah. As opposed to the specialization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a cousin who's literally played baseball year round since he was five. And he's junior, senior in high school. You know, and uh, um, I think his mom has has fantasies of, of him going and, and playing in college and playing pro. And, and, and I'm just sitting on the sidelines just waiting for that rotator cuff to blow and, and right. you, know, you know, waiting for Tommy John surgery. And I'm just like, yeah, because that's all he does. You know, in fact, he's finishing up school ball this month and then we'll immediately transition into travel ball and he literally plays pretty much year round yeah and and that's all he does right um so i had a nephew who uh had to have elbow surgery because of that he's a baseball player but when he wasn't playing baseball he was throwing the football <laughs> he was a pitcher <laughs> a baseball pitcher but when he right? wasn't pitching he was throwing the football well yeah. Caden, <laughs> it's on, the dude. same thing, buddy. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, it's unfortunate. For sure. Um, there, so 17. There is an interesting phenomenon that I found with my daughters as, uh, uh, and I've finally gone through it with all three of them. Um, and so there's, you know, 
there is, I think there's an advantage to being a father of daughters. I don't know because I haven't had sons, but I compare my own relationship with my father. And, uh, uh, and that was a, a strained and uncomfortable relationship. We were never really sure, you know, about each other. And there was this, you and your father. Yeah. There was this, yeah. this undercurrent of like, competition and yes supplanting and um like i was but the interesting thing was is like i was never vying to take my dad's place right but i was vying it's just to a weird male thing man distance myself from him right yeah. and, and establish myself as my own guy right yeah now the irony is is that uh, uh my dad's been dead 10 years now and every year that passes I look in the mirror and go, holy shit, I am my dad. I am, yeah. I am so much. I see him in me so much. Dude, cat's in the cradle in the silver. <laughs> right? right? Little it's boy. Blue. It's 100%. Oh, man, it's 100%, true. 100%, right? Oh, my um, God. And, and just the genetics of, like, you know, like my face and, like, <laughs> So I was doing, I posted on Instagram uh, a little while back. I've been playing, I've been trying to rehab a shoulder. And so I've been playing with clubs. Yeah. And um, my, I was doing a, a double club swing and you got to put a little mental effort into that. So you don't brain yourself in the back of the head when the club's coming by. And so I had my focused look on. <laughs> It was my look dad. just like your dad. Oh, I look just like my dad. I was like, and so it's this sort of like intent, focused stare that you know, as a kid, scared the piss out of me. Like it's it's intimidating, right? This yeah. like masculine, you know, focused face. Um. So yeah, it's just this this irony that this guy that you spent so much time as a kid trying to get away i'm not like my dad i'm not my dad my dad that's yeah. him over there and then you know to wake up and go nope buddy that's you you know yes for sure um, yeah but with my daughters you know as a father of daughters um really for the first 17 18 years you can really do no wrong like you are you are, Your daughters could do no wrong. No, or I could do no wrong. Okay. Right? Like, whenever whenever my daughters were pissed at one of us, it, they were always pissed at Samantha. They were always... Yeah, the like, same pissed. sex stuff, that's weird, yes, right? Yes, right? Yeah. And so, like, daddy is, daddy is the hero. Daddy is the rock. Daddy is, you know, he's the good guy. You're the one with the soft spot, Dave. Right? Until, yes. until <laughs> they're getting ready to move on. And then they have to start pushing you away to create this distance, right? Yeah. And then you can do no right. Like you can't uh, do anything right. Like and and so, um, and the awesome thing is, is that that's actually only a short, short window. You know, um, my oldest daughter is is coming back around now. She's um, she's married now, and uh, um, you know, she's actually she actually reaches out to me. Um, in a way that she hadn't reached out before. So, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's good. That's a gift. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, kids and managing adult children, right. As they, as they transition from this place where they are dependent upon you to where they are becoming independent and stretching out on their own and, and yeah. figuring out their own way through the world. Um, yeah. At about the same time that you are now middle aged, you know, and exhausted, <laughs> <laughs> right? I like have been raising you for twenty three years. Let's go, right? I had this epiphany the other day: is that uh, uh, I'm the same age as Archie Bunker. Wow, I'm actually older. I'm right than, behind you, man. I'm actually older than George Jefferson. Isn't it crazy though, Dave? Because I think about this all the time. How much, how much, I don't want to say better, right? But how much better our generation is than their generation? Yeah. Like, look at, just look at, like, uh, I always use mu musicians as an example. Like, look at um, Journey. Mm -hmm. 
there was nobody in shape and journey. No. Right. Just in terms of like physicality, yeah. right. Our generation has done a much better job of staying in the game right yeah. now. Maybe you could make the argument that they were actually too engaged putting food on the table. Right? I would actually, I would make that argument that I think that the previous generations, like I look at my grandfather at 50 years old. Yeah. I look at my dad at 50 years old. And, yeah. You know, and then I look at myself at 50 and I'm like, oh, wow, I look, you know, I look way better than they did. Right. Yeah. But I didn't have the stressors that they had to go through. You know, I mean, right. my grandfather, you may actually, through, we may have more stresses as well. So let me ask you this, Dave. How involved were your parents in your upbringing? Um, like, for example, I walked home when I was six years old from school. Yeah. I opened the door by myself. I fed myself. I walked myself to baseball practice. I walked home from baseball practice. Not once did my parents have to drive me there. Not once did they have to pick me up at school. Not once did they have to feed me lunch at school. I was responsible for that shit from the age of six. Wow. My parents never entertained me. I mean, they would play with me if I wanted to, right? But I think our generation, you're, you're an empty nester now, but I think we have this, I don't know who put this on us, but our children want to be entertained much more like if i wanted if i wanted to have fun i went outside and found my friends yeah i didn't say dad can we i don't know do something mom can we do something no i got out of the house and found the kids down the block yeah right yeah i, I think in some ways we have more stress their stress was financial i believe well, or. whenever Samantha and I have these conversations, I, I always fall back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yes. I think that, you know, I think that we're higher up the pyramid. Um, like somebody said the other day um, that, you know, inflation has just recently hit levels parallel to where they are during the Depression, mm. which makes absolutely no sense to me. Because like, I'm not saying that's not true, but what I'm saying is, is that the experience of my world versus the experience of my grandfather's world at, at that same economic condition yeah. are light years apart. Yes. Like, yeah. like, okay, so that very well may be true, but that's completely, that's an apples and oranges comparison. Yeah. Like the availability of food, the availability of entertainment, the availability of like, I mean, if we're at conditions similar to the Great Depression, I'm in no fear of losing my house. Right. I'm yeah. in no fear of not having enough food. Um, so I don't understand. I don't understand that comparison at all. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily get that either. You know, I it's, think, a, it's a deep study though, right? Because I think about this all the time. Where, you have a college degree, correct? Actually, I dropped out before I finished. So, oh, okay. Right. But we're expected to have college degrees now. Right. Yeah. Right. And now BSs or BAs are not even enough. Yeah. Right. So for the longest time, you could be a master's degree physical therapist and work. Yeah. But now you're no longer to able to do that now you have to be a doctor of physical therapy yeah. right their generation our parents and maybe our grandparents as well could come directly out of high school and get like so i'm from pennsylvania part of the rust belt are mm -hmm. you know that billy joel song because you're my age billy joel we're living here in allentown yeah. Town, yeah. right yeah yeah the steel industry that's why Pittsburgh Steelers, right? And that's why people where I, I've grown up, they're not Philadelphia Eagles fans. They're Steeler fans because our right. grandfathers came out of high school, came back from the Second World War, 
and move directly. Like there wasn't a four year requirement to go to college and pay a hundred fucking thousand dollars for a four year <laughs> degree. Right. Oh, right. but your four year degree is no longer good enough. Right. Now you need to have a doctorate to show people what to do with rubber bands for the rotator cuff. Right. Right. Yeah. It's just crazy. It's, it is it's insane. It is insane. Right. My parents built their house for eleven uh, for eleven thousand dollars. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Right? Pensions? Yeah. What's that? Find a pension. Yeah, find a pension <laughs> in twenty twenty one. Find a company that's giving you a pension in addition to like a four oh one K, a matching four oh one K, right? And as a self employed individuals, man, people are like you don't know how well you have it being self employed. <laughs> I know there's nobody to match my 401k, buddy. Right. Gnarly. Right. I don't get I don't get sick leave. Right. Right. Retirement, I'm sick. That? I'm not getting paid, buddy. You know, or I have to pay into that insurance privately. Yeah. For sure. So that's one thing and, I think about about that generation. And that you're generation. actually getting taxed twice as much because your employer is not paying. You know. Yes. You're paying self-employment tax, and yeah, it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Payroll taxes. Right? Payroll taxes as a self employed individual, you get hit twice. That's what people don't understand. When my accountant told me that, I was like, What? Yeah. Right? And you can never declare unemployment because you can't lay yourself off. Right? How nuts is that? Especially last year. I can't. Yeah. Well, you took away 100% of my business. <laughs> what do you want me to do? I can't declare uh, unemployment. Yeah. What do you want, do you want me to die? Yeah. Well, here you, you, you can apply for a loan. Right? Yeah, here's a loan, right? <laughs> or the the well, they call it a loan, right? But what was the other one? There was a grant. There was the emergency disaster loan, and then there was the uh, uh, the PPP, which they never called a grant. They called it a loan. But the first was, ten thousand or something that was, was a grant. most likely going to be forgiven. Yes, and I, I was don't like. Has it been? Has it been? I don't know. I didn't get it. Yeah, like, I didn't I, get it I, either. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm good. I'll be okay. I um, did apply for it, but I didn't get it approved because I had froze. I froze my, my credit. Somebody hacked into my accounts, so I froze uh, all of my credit, and they couldn't access my credit. Oh my god! So they didn't approve me. But I think actually it was a blessing in disguise not to yeah. get that thing. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, Crazy times we're living, Dave, as, the, oh as physical God. educators in this crazy world that doesn't right. necessarily appreciate the physical culture <laughs> or physical educators, to that, be honest. That has been a, a very interesting hurdle to navigate. Um, you know, trying to promote something like, I don't think there's any other industry that tries to sell a product that generally no one actually wants. Yes. There's a very small, I mean, if you're a coach or um, an athletic trainer, then there are athletes who are specifically coming after you. But when you're training general pop, right? When you're training like everyday people, they're only doing it out of a sense for the vast majority they're doing it out of a sense of obligation and this is what i'm supposed to do right very yes. few of them actively want this and so it's a hard sell man it's it's a, it truly is and i it's interesting dave i was on the phone last night with a gentleman from australia glenn and uh he's having a hard time and he does beautiful work but it's a real tough sell to get people to, to buy into the beautiful work. And even when it was actually, Dave, it was at that workshop that you and I did with Chip, mm -hmm. Minnesota. At uh, Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Yeah. We, we just got done playing for 90 minutes. We did everything. Anything that you could have hoped for physically. There was yeah. mobility, flexibility, strength. Yeah. endurance every biomotor skill you could ever want and do you remember what the woman asked me at the end of the 90 minute session remind i remember me. these I things a, I have a feeling, yeah but remind me because I, I i want i want to hear it when are we working out <laughs> when are we working out i was like what 
What are we working out? <laughs> like we just did rope swings and Dave Hall, who weighs right? 350, did a rope. <laughs> I don't know what you weigh. I don't, I don't think you I weigh was, 350. But. I was heavy then. I was, I was much heavier than I am now. I actually remember that. Like, dude, like, you did a rope. Go. <laughs> dude, you did a rope swing and then a dive roll over those gymnastic uh, squares. I was like, what, what, what word do you want, ma'am? <laughs> like, what do you want to do? Like air squats? Like we've we've adjust, we've ad addressed absolutely every single motor skill that you could. But it didn't we come in that. We didn't come in that box, right? It wasn't three no, sets didn't of come ten in that or three box. sets of eight or whatever. Yeah, and, Dave, and we got to change it, man. We got to change it. So when when I was discussing this with Glenn from Australia, and it sounds like a sellout, and I'm afraid maybe to approach it using this type of terminology but i think if we start to sell more play-based stuff and more more of the stuff that turn you and i on as uh high performance coaching mm -hmm. for like creative entrepreneurship or creative problem solving or something from like a business minded CEO, high performance, entrepreneurial type of approach. That may be what we have to do because selling, a, and Dave, you and I have done this together. Selling play-based workshops is not, it's a tough sell, right? No. No. You're, not, you're not paying your mortgage with these type of workshops, unfortunately, but yeah. it's exactly what people want. So this guy, Glenn, he offers two different classes, strength and mobility, gymnastics based type of stuff where it's body weight, strength and mobility. And then he has something that he calls the movement class and it's rhythm based, it's dance based and people leave the movement class feeling so good, alive, yeah. energetic, turned on, powerful, but they still feel, uh, this isn't his word, cheated because it wasn't a workout. But because they equate the workout with suffering and they didn't suffer. They didn't suffer. They enjoyed themselves, I guess. Right. But I bet if we were to test Dave, I bet if we were to test like stress hormones and, and I'm sure there's a good way to test mood, right? Like a questionnaire or survey or something we would do better if we did the play based and the rhythm based and the dance based oh, yeah. stuff, right. As opposed to the workout. I, I I think we could come up with some type of measurement for these type of things. But like you said, it's uh, what, what, what did you just say? What was the phrase you just said? They, didn't they cheat it. They feel they cheated. They feel cheated because they didn't suffer. They did not suffer. Yeah. And we have brainwashed people into believing that exercise has to be suffering. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's penance for all the other things that you do that you enjoy penance for that donut yeah i mean how many right. times throughout your career has a client come in on a monday morning and the session starts with confession of everything yes. that they did wrong over the weekend yes right so they right. are cleansing their souls right and they are confessing to you you know oh father forgive me for i have sinned um how many burpees do i need to do in order to make penance for you know my transgressions yeah and, and yeah I, so how could we and unfortunately dave it is our fellow colleagues oh, dude. that are responsible for this communication of the suffering right and i'm not against hard work no of course not right the work has to be hard but there's pleasure in hard work I'm sure you feel great at the end of a hard work day, right? Yes, absolutely. Right? Uh, we just had to cut down a pine tree on my property. And as a way to, you know, I asked my sons to move the firewood. Yeah. They, re they were reluctant, right? <laughs> but they did it. And it must have been two tons of firewood. They felt great after it. So much because when you can, right? When you, when you have like this accomplishment, when you're at, the, at the end of a hard work day, you're like, I accomplished something. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be un, it doesn't have to be 
it can still be pleasurable and be hard. Like jujitsu, it's pleasurable, but it's hard, it's right? Hard. It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And I look forward to right. it every time. Um, I think working out is the mental suffering, Dave, because it's disconnected from anything genuine. To go back to a term that you said in the beginning of the, the call, it's disconnected. So my, my mentor, Frank Ferencic, you know our term white noise? Yep. It's white movement. Yeah. And it's white movement because it's artificial. Yeah. Right. It's just this exercise. And I don't want to say artificial, like, well, I'm squatting. Aren't humans supposed to squat? Yes. But it's a squat removed from any task based endeavor. Like I squat down to pick up my keys. I squat down to play catch with my son. I squat down to pick up my, my shepherd. I don't squat just to squat 100 times in thir three minutes. You know, I think, I think there's a couple of problems and let me see if I can unpack this properly. I think first off is that the general pop fitness industry is actually informed by sports and athletics. Yes. So what now, happened? I agree. Yeah, yes. So like I remember when I was getting started and MMA was gaining in prominence and suddenly you were seeing all these videos of that's when battle ropes became popular. Right. right? That's when, yeah. you know, all the, these different sledgehammers, uh, uh, slams on a tire, right? All of these modalities suddenly became, these tools became popular because that's what the MMA guys were doing. And right. there's such there's such specimens of physical fitness that in order to in order to do that we should do that. I think the problem is is that gen pop fitness is marketed and sold um, as a form of it's it's sold based off of aesthetics, basically make me pretty yeah right make me fuckable right? yes so I, so I go to all this effort right? which Reason is an I'm, admirable goal right it could it's be not a bad goal except no. except that it is an inherently selfish goal yes right and so be strong to be useful right chip always talks about that so what happens is is that we pursue this aesthetic goal um, and so I think this is why the market is saturated with 18 to 30 year olds, right? Because right. those people are primarily fixated with getting their first mate, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you will, and those young people. Or just hooking up on the weekends. Or just hooking up on the weekends or whatever, for right. sure. And yeah. they last, they go to the gym and they're consumers of fitness up to the point where for the dudes, they get married. For the women, it's their first kid. Yeah. Right? And so they're, they're consistent consumers up to that point. And then when those two things happen, they fall off and they disappear. And then sometime between middle 30s and early 40s, you see them come back because they just had a divorce. And now they're back in the game. And they're like, yeah, they oh, got to get hot again. They got to get fuckable I gotta, again. Right? They got to get fuckable again. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Dave, that should be a, that should and, be on your marketing, buddy. Get and, more fuckable. <laughs> that demographic lasts until the second date. Once they've dated somebody for the second date, they're like, okay, I can stick with this one. And we're right. Go, right. Because right. they're, they're 40 years old and they got, ain't got time to play around anymore. Um, but so because it's based on this selfish, um, which is not a bad thing, but because it's all self-oriented, right? Whenever the inevitable complexities of life arise, i.e. that you do have children and they, have, they put demands on your life and you have sports practice and laundry and running a household and all of these things, these demands get placed on you, that working out and exercising gets pushed aside because that is a selfish thing. And these other things are more important. Yes. Whereas if we had actually sold it as being a better human being, 
being yeah. a better, you know, that your existence is, yes, stronger people are more useful, right? And your life is actually easier when you're stronger. Like stressors, right. the stressors that drive you down have to work much harder to drive you down. You're more resilient. Yes. So you are more capable at doing laundry and getting the kids to sports practice. You're more available for your kids because you have more energy because you're not drained constantly. You handle stress better, right? But that's a complicated cell. <laughs> and it's much easier to, and, and we're, you know, we're driven by lowest common denominator and path of least resistance. Yeah. So it's much easier for us to market and sell, um, you know, get your sexy back. Yeah, it is. But it's, it's not sustainable. It is not. And As so, uh, my mentor, Frank French, says, don't quit your day job. Right. Don't quit your, because the body is just not honored. It's just not respected in a way that's, uh, you know, some people, some people do really well with it. Other people struggle. And that's a great observation of yours, Dave, from that, that 18 to 30 year old, uh, um, age group cohort or whatever. Now, I think the people who actually do better are the people who actually have a thing that they do that fitness then informs, right? So, you know, the, uh, the 30 year old guy or the 35 year old dad who has fallen in love with jujitsu. Yes. Right. He's, he is more likely to stick with some form of training because it, it will actually make his jujitsu better. And so he has an investment there. Yes. How do you, which get... exercise should have been from the beginning, right? Yes. A means yeah. to something else. Yes. And in that sense, right? I mean, I can see where a squat program or, you know, a more traditional um, workout, you know, yeah. sets and reps and all that. So, so you go in, you do this work because this is not my physical outlet. This is the thing I do so that I can be better at my physical outlet, right? But there's yeah. so many people that don't have a physical outlet who take training and approach it like like they're athletes yeah and you know and and i don't want to denigrate anybody by saying that you know there are athletes and there are not athletes but like are you really or are you just you know doing this thing because why not do something that you enjoy right? yeah I mean, exercise is totally unnecessary yeah you're gonna burn the same number of calories in a play-based workout than you are in three sets of 10. So right. go have fun. So Dave, I don't know if you track anything. I don't, I'm not a big metrics person, right? right? So I don't track anything, but I, one of my greatest loves in life is walking. Yeah. Oh and I God. just walk. You, I walk. You actually have inspired that in me because I remember, I remember early blog posts and you talking about your walking. Um, I'm going to do a whole course on walking, Dave. I'm going to do a whole coach, coaching yeah. program for the other fitness professionals on walking. But I, I, mean, I just wear a Fitbit. It's nothing tech. You know, it's not like I'm not. It's real simple metrics. It's calories burned. And I will look at that. And I will look at the same thing from walking the same time. So if I walk for 30 minutes or jog the same distance, not necessarily the same time, the caloric burn is the same, but one was enjoyable and the other one was a workout, right? So the, the, the ideas, Henry David Thoreau had a, or was it Emerson? I walked to get ideas out of my head. So there's all these not into my head, right? So I don't do the podcast and I don't do, and actually the first time you hosted that workshop, uh, Mental Meatheads, Elliot asked me if I listened to a podcast when I walk. And I said, no, because I walk to get ideas out of my head, not into my head. But um, the caloric burn is the same. But the value you get from the walk is not in the calories. It's in all of the intangibles that you, you know, it's the creativity. There, a lot of people have written about this. When the intensity is too high, it actually impedes the other functions, right? So like philosophers, what's the word? 
philosophized, philosophized yeah. while walking. Yeah. While walking, because the pace that the human brain works at and the human body works at is at that low intensity rhythmic pace of walking, not running. Because when we raise the intensity too high, your your things are focusing on this as opposed to just letting it wander and roam, right? Yeah, I don't know, Dave. It's a tough sell. But I, I have faith in professionals like you and Chip and my buddy from Australia, Glenn. Yeah. I think together we can make a dent in this, but you got to be a tough guy, right? Yeah. You got to be a tough person if you're, you're going to want that, if you want to do it. And it's got to be yeah. the long game. It's got to be the long game. And we may have to make less money. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. We may have to like less money than the uh, six, six minute abs course. Yeah. Well, I mean, actually, I think at this point in my career, um, that's a given. Um, <laughs> but I am, I'm also. I remember you said your gym was basically a nonprofit. <laughs> I think that even despite that, it has always consistently given me everything I needed. Yeah. I mean, I made it through a pandemic. I made it through, you know, I, I, I did, right? And like, that's, that's a big deal, dude. And, and, you know, I mean, yeah, I picked up side jobs whenever I needed to, but guess right. what? I'm physically capable of doing that. And yeah. I'm physically capable, even at 50, of picking up the side jobs that other people don't want to do, you know? So I just finished up a tree job that we had a tornado come through here about a month ago, knocked a bunch of trees down and, uh, um, you know, got hooked up with a friend of a friend and, and she was like, you know, will you come take a look at it? And I was like, yeah, come take a look at it. I was like, here's what you need to understand. You know, I'm not going to be able to work at it every day. I'm not going to be able to work at it, you know, but I'll come in here and, and knock it out a little bit at a time. And it took me, I don't know, I spent maybe three weeks on it, maybe four, you know, I was like, there's only two, three days a week that I can come in here and even put any time on it. The other days I'm at the gym. Did you like, put the uh, firewood in your red truck? Oh, of course I did. That's still running? <laughs> oh, yes. 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 Beautiful. I'm still keeping it alive. There's still, a, there's still Fred Flintstone on the uh, passenger side, too. So it's, uh, uh, it's an extra air conditioning vent. <laughs> right. <laughs> Airflow is important down here. Fred Flintstone. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, that's a gift. And so I'd rather do what I'm happy at and, you know, and not get rich, then make a million bucks and be miserable the entire time. Yes. Life's too short. Yeah. Somebody said wealth is what you don't see. Yeah, for sure. Right. right. You know, and I, I think you can be wealthy in many ways. It's true. Yeah. And, and there are, Economics is fundamentally a study of value. Yes. And, and money is just one, is just a form of exchange of value. It's not actually the value itself. It's just a form of exchange. <clears throat> and there are many ways to exchange value. So, you know, I will put, I will put effort into, uh, into tasks that I may not get financial remuneration from, um, but I got to spend time with somebody whose company I really enjoy and I benefit from that way or, you know, or any of a number of, of modicums of exchange. Um, I think it's important that we sort of expand, you know, just like you expand your horizons in terms of what movement and exercise is like apply that to, you know, to the world and to your life. And as long as it is, you know, as long as those exchanges are equitable and everybody's happy with the exchange, it's great. So value. Yes. Yeah. Study value. Value. 
And it's, it's uh, have you ever read Your Money or Your Life? No. They talk a lot about that in, uh, like, they have this thing, I think it's called Life Energy. And what they want you to do is go through what you make per hour, but what you truly make per hour, right? So, if, <laughs> like, if you drive an hour to work and then drive an hour back, that's essentially yeah. two extra hours of work. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. Or you just bought a shirt that cost you $100. How many hours of your life was that $300 shirt? I mean, how many, if you bought a shirt for $100 and you make $10 an hour, yeah, right? You had to work a full day yeah. just to purchase that shirt, right? Whereas if you were satisfied with a more simple shirt, you could have worked two hours that day, right? And spent the rest of the time in your strength garden or Emerson Acres right. hanging with the goats. Yep. Your money or your life. Uh -huh. The gentleman that wrote it passed away, but I think it's co-written with someone else who's still, still around talking about it. Cool. Dominguez. All right. I got it. I got that title written down. I'll, uh, yeah. Good book. I'll snag that. So, uh, uh, What's your daily practice look like these days? Wake up. Uh, you talk of physical practice? Just, you know, walk me through a, a day in the life of Jason C. Brand. Wake up, start the coffee maker. While let the puppies out. Now, unfortunately, underneath my shed, a family of rabbits have moved in. And the white shepherd that looks like your white shepherd <laughs> is an expert hunter. So on Easter morning, oh killed, no, <laughs> killed the Easter bunny, killed the Easter bunny. So, oh. oh, Dave, my eight-year-old was like, "Why is there a dead bunny in the backyard?" I was like, "Cause your sister killed it." But I walk down, shepherds follow me. I turn on the coffee maker. Now I have to scan the backyard because there's a few orphans. <laughs> in the backyard, uh, let the dogs out, go upstairs, take a cold shower, always take a cold shower, which is a little you know, sad in Philadelphia because our tap water doesn't get, you know, in the summer, it's not, it's not ref as refreshing as it is in the winter. What yeah. are you gonna say, Nate? Just that uh, uh, I, I restarted that practice. <clears throat> Jiu Jitsu brother of mine convinced me to do the 75 hard thing. And so I did that the first of the year. And then he was like, are you gonna do phase one? And I was like, What's phase one? Okay, all right, fine, I'll do that. It's a five minute cold shower. And so okay. um, I did that for. How started... cold is the water, Dave and Alan? <laughs> let's, let's call that lukewarm. It's relative. <laughs> okay, okay. It still makes me gasp. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So you, you started practicing that? Yeah, and that's been like. It's beautiful, right? It's a beautiful right? practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so go on, but yeah, that's, I second that. That's huge. I have a real simple practice, Dave. I, I will take the cold shower and then I get the boys pre prepared for school. They just went back full time, uh, physically in person. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I come back from walking them, cause we walk to school, we're only nice. two blocks away from the school. And unfortunately going back to our conversations, there's people that drive their children to the school. That's two blocks away. <laughs> There's no fear of stranger danger, Dave. There's none, right? So after I walk my boys to school, I walk home. Then the bare minimum is three miles with the uh, the shepherds. Nice. Then when I come home, it's usually time to do a little work task up until about noon. At some point, we have jujitsu class at noon. I head over to there. I train for about maybe one and a half to two hours, come home. I get a little bit more work done uh, before I got to go back and get the schools. So my current situation, and I'm probably similar to you and many fitness professionals, my wife has a real job. So in between myself seeing students, clients, and I'm the primary caregiver because my wife is holding shit down in our home office. So I do, you know, I do most of the, uh, boy activities, taking them to their sports, picking them up from school, making sure they're well-fed. Probably, I'm not a good cook like Dave Hall, 
Whatever. But at least they're not starving, right? And so that's it. My physical practice is pretty basic as well. I call it my strength garden. I'm sitting in a 200 square foot shed that has everything you would need. CMBs, which we spoke about in the beginning, dumbbells, ton of different grip tools, a few kettlebells. And then outside in the yard, I have a 12 foot rogue fitness rack or, you know, gymnastics rings, 45 degree angle monkey bars, trap bars, barbells, dip stations, any rope climb. Uh, but my practice is really basic physically. I just do a bunch of play-based stuff with the jujitsu guys. And uh, for the most part, I just do some body weight training calisthenics. Nice. Yeah, keeps me happy, keeps me playful, keeps me right. spry for the, for the youngins in the crowd. Yeah. You're still I also read all quite a bit, out, Dave. So. What's that? I said you're still gorgeous as all get Oh, out, thank so. you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I do try to, just to go back to the, I try to be physical first, and I'm going to do a video on this. I try to be physical first because if I can get the physicality out of the way, then my mind is a little more uh, relaxed, yeah. and then I can go deeper because I do, the bare minimum when it comes to reading, Dave, is at least 10 pages. I try to read 10 pages. If I get more, that's beautiful. But yeah. the minimum that I get in is 10. What are you so, reading right now? I'm reading, unfortunately, I'm jumping around a, a little too much. But today I read Chip's book. Oh, the latest one? Yeah. Nice. Today I was reading Chip, Chip's book, um, which is a real easy read to get 10 pages because, you know, the pages <laughs> are this big, right? It's not, a, it's, right? There's not it's a 300 words. Book. <laughs> There's no 300 words per page, which is, you know, it's, it's, but it's, it's to the point quite well. So, yeah. Cool. That's nice. Awesome. It's uh, to, to quote what it, what is, I, I posted about this a few weeks ago, talking about Rose, Rose Nama Yunus. Um, it's not hers. It's uh, another artist, but uh, she shaved her head. So her practice, because it was interfering with her practice. And uh, I remember an artist saying, be orderly and boring in your, I'm going to screw this up. Be orderly and boring in your life so you can be violent and original in your art. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 You bored during your day? Nope. Just the way I like it, sir. So you're reading, do you, uh, is it primarily nonfiction or do you dabble? In yeah, I, I would really love to enjoy fiction, but I just can't get into it. I have a hard time also with like watching movies that are 100% fictional as well. I don't know. It's like a weird thing in my head. If it's historically, if it's a historical fiction and I know there's some reality to it, like a, you can embellish the story, like the 300, the 300 wasn't that crazy right? right but that battle actually did take place yeah so then i can watch that type of stuff but if it's like i don't know zombie shit yeah i, feel I can't get okay. into zombie shit right yeah i can't get into fiction unless it's historically based and i can enjoy it like if i, I go know. back i go back and forth um i actually my physical reading the books that i read are especially right now, primarily nonfiction. The, um, but I like um, in the truck when I'm driving back and forth to work, um, yeah. I'll, I'll listen to um, just ridiculous fiction. Um, but uh, uh, if you were to entertain a fictional, this actually would fit within that uh, 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 historical framework that you prefer. Um, check out Stephen Price, Pressfield's latest book, um, uh, Man, Man at Arms. Arms. Yes. Yeah. I don't have it. And, but I, that's one thing. Yeah, that's one book that I've been thinking of picking up. It's, uh, but see, uh, his stuff is so – it's 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 fiction, but it it's, feels more like history, right? Yes, yes. He, he definitely picks a very historical framework. It's not, it's, it's not fantastical. It's not fantasy. Right. Uh, uh, um, and uh, this one's kind of rough, dude. It's uh, uh, there's there's a couple of gut punches in it that, that yeah. caught me unaware. So I was like, "Damn, dude!" I should get it too because I like that whole thing of uh, 
ancient Christianity as well. Right. It's tied in there, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's basically the the a a fictional account of how the uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians gets delivered to the Corinthians in Greece. How it yeah. makes its way from. Uh, um, North Africa and the, and the Mediterranean and, and gets there. And, uh, so, and, and he's very steeped in, in ancient Roman history. And, and so, yeah, I'm sure there's, he, uh, I was, he was just on a podcast called, uh, warrior poet. Oh, okay. And he talked about Steve and talked about that. He was like, yeah, it's fiction, but you know, I just take shit that really happened. You know, it's like his legend of Bhagavans. Have you seen that? Yeah. That's that's Krishna speaking to Arjuna on the, le- the like Bhagavan. Bhagavan means yeah. God in Sanskrit, right? So it was the legend yeah. of Bhagavan, the legend of Bhagavans, right? So that yeah. was the ba- Bhagavad Gita, but on a golf course. Right? Right. There's something. Uh... And Will Smith, because Krishna, the God, is black. It's interesting that he chose Will Smith yeah. to be the charioteer because Krishna was the charioteer to this warrior named Arjuna. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool, right? So that's, that's, super, like, that's historical Hinduism, right? That's what I love about him is that all of his stories, while they are, there's the concrete story that takes place in this plane, there is a much larger mythic plane just right behind it that gives it uh, um, yeah, I mean, he tells big, big stories. Yes. Um, and so, yeah. That's, uh, it's one thing to lead, what is it? It's one thing to study war, another to live a warrior's life. Yeah. And that's from his other book on, um, who's the main character in uh, Man of Arms? Oh, uh, uh, Telemachus. Yes, yes. He says that in one of the previous books. It's one thing to study war, another to live a warrior's life. Yeah, there's uh, uh, his uh, uh, his account of um, the Battle of Thermopylae. Yes. The uh, um, Gates of Fire. Yes. There is a character named, I believe his name is, no, Telamon is the character. Telamon of Arcadia. Yes. Yes. And, uh, but there is a Telemachus in, ah. uh, who's sort of an, an ancillary there's like so like there's these threads that fit through here like there's this warrior archetype that he yeah really his his speaking to. dude that series of, on the warrior archetype was sweet wasn't it yeah yeah, yeah. somebody sweet. dave should do a, a work on the creator archetype yeah i think that'd be interesting um i well, use artist archetype but i think the correct technical Jungian term is creator archetype creator as opposed to artists. I'm going to have to do a little digging into that though, because I think that, I think that those two archetypes are very much akin to which one, both the creator and the warrior. Like they're both. I mean, if you look at my new brand, Iron Kimono Warrior Artist. Yeah. Yeah. I think. And who's to say one is not an artist of war? Right, the War of Art. What's what's the who wrote the War of Art? Uh, Pressfield. No, he was the art of he was the he was the War of Art. Who wrote the Art of War? Oh, Sun Tzu. Yes. Yeah. Right. Look at that little artist brain right there, just taking the same title and just <laughs> flipping right? it. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and they both require a certain level of fearlessness, and, yeah. and they both require like they're, so. They're two sides of the same coin, right? It's yeah. that whole, uh, um, uh, it's, it's Kali. It's, you know, both creator and destroyer. Yes. Um, just, he talks you know. about that in the artist journey book that he wrote. Do you have that, Dave? Um, I'm going to have love to look it. back. And, and I feel like, I, like I try to stay, I try to follow him um, a lot because I really enjoy him as an author. Yeah. Um, so, but it may be one of those that I ran through years ago and need to go back and revisit. Um, so I have, like I've read um, War of Art and I've read Do the Work and uh, uh, a lot of those, a lot of his, his works on, you know, the creative process. Yes. Uh, but that sounds like one that I made. Artist journey. I've missed. So it's the hero's journey? 
right? Yes. But just for the artist. I think he actually thinks the artist's journey is above the hero's journey, like in terms of like a higher uh, timeline. Yeah, you know, I mean, so like the hero's journey is basically the transition from from childhood, adolescence to adulthood. Right. Right. And so, like, it seems to me that the artist's journey is what you do after you become an adult, you know? That's like, deep. I mean, you have to have, you know, like we started this conversation with, you have to have suffering in order to have something to create from. So, Dave, this is something to think about for the live courses that you're going to offer at Emerson Acres. Okay. Cool? Cool. I'm there. Taking notes. Physicality, yes, yeah. but I know this is a, for a fact. Steve and Pressfield reached out to our boy Zach. Really? Yes, about doing. I don't know what they would be. Uh, I hesitate to use the word workshop because I don't know if that's what Stephen would call them, but presentations in gym settings. So, could you imagine that if we get together and we talk about the warrior arts? and the war of art at emerson uh acres right yeah. how cool would that be and steven is there and we can talk about all these cool things the physicality oh god you know. i would geek boy so bad <laughs> <laughs> so he replies he, he directly replies to messages so let us open up a little bit more and, and rock a few workshops and then then we'll we'll present yeah it to i think that sounds like a good that would be idea. sweet though right we could do the that whole wonderful it would be totally wonderful i think he's actually living in greece now though that's all right people are traveling again it's true yeah. of course you know what's the worst case is that we travel to greece to go do a workshop i always wanted to go to greece uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> not a bad place to go right right for sure yeah. You'll need your vaccine passport, though, Dave. I don't know if you're into that type uh, of thing or not into that type of thing. I don't know if that's true. You know, that, uh, uh, yeah, don't even. I, I was just joking, brother. Don't even bring it up. It's uh, you know, I mean, it's it is timely and it is real. And, but I am, I am a fundamental believer in personal autonomy. Yes. I'm a fundamental believer in personal responsibility, right? And to, to mandate anything like this just doesn't sit well with me. It just doesn't. Yeah. And, I agree with you totally. Um, so I'm, with any of it, even with the masks, I'm not yeah. anti-mask. Yeah. But if you feel you want to wear it, please wear it. Please. Absolutely. It's just like anything else. I don't ride my bicycle with a helmet. Right. But my kids do. Right. But if you're an adult and you want to wear a helmet. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. But I don't unless I'm going down some big hills. Yeah. I don't wear it to the corner market. Yeah. I, I just, yeah. I, Should I? Uh, maybe. <laughs> but it's your choice. Yeah. Right? And you are you are an adult and you are willing to live with the ramifications and the repercussions of what happens if it goes wrong. Right? Same with seatbelts. Seatbelts, all of those things. And okay. so, yeah. Obesity, type 2 diabetes. Oh, you got no. type 2 diabetes because you eat the wrong shit. Right? And you're overweight. It's a choice. It is a choice. It's a personal choice, just like yeah. you said. And and I think the I don't know what it is about me, but it's those inconsistencies that drive me nuts. Yeah. Right? Me too. So, you know, you're not gonna mandate people's diets because that is an imposition. And I totally agree with that. If you want to eat like shit, then you eat like shit. That's entirely up to you, right? You are 
no, it, we were, so the FDA has just recently decided that they're going to make menthol and cigarettes illegal. Have you seen that? I know. How stupid is that? That's like making menthol, outlawing Dr. Pepper, but not outlawing Coke. Right, exactly. Yes, yeah. 100%, right? Like, like seriously? That's because it has a higher caffeine content. <sighs> seriously. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's so inconsistent, right? It's true, it is. So. Yeah. That's why we just need to play, Dave. Out of yes, nature. right? You know, and, and what is play? What is play inherently but risk management? That's you great. get out into the world, right? I, my, my wife taught nursery for years at a, a local Waldorf school here. And um, I remember early on in her career, um, a child bumped, you know, fell off of a slide or something like that, bumped themselves on the playground, right? And there was a parental overreaction. And... Um, I wrote this letter to the newsletter um, for the school talking about how the playground was a place of risk management. It's where children learn to, to assess and deal with risk, right? Yes. So yes. It, is, it is a controlled environment, right? The, it's practice the chaos to develop control, Dave. Yes, 100%. And so, um, and the school wouldn't publish it. <laughs> no because it was too risky it was and i was it, like the 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 conversation on risk management was too risky <laughs> for the risk uh evaluators or right. whatever they're called right what are they called I don't you know, know these smart people with the with the what what are the the insurance uh, people called oh the actuaries yes actuary <laughs> Your article was too risky. Your article on risk management was too risky for the actuaries. Right. You know, the just... risk actuaries. Seriously. Sorry. Dave, sir, I love you. I love I you too, brother. I've kept you up for almost two hours, man. It's great. I love talk talking, man. Thank we'll you have to talk in person. So much. Emerson yes. Acres. What are the 100%. names of the goats? Okay, so we have uh, Honey. Honey. Who, uh, is uh, the white one that only has three legs. And then there's Harriet, and Harriet, Harriet has a little, yeah. Harriet has a lightning bolt on her forehead. Uh, yes. So she was the girls named her for you know kind of a Harry Potter ripoff. Okay. And, uh, I believe actually, so these goats came from my grandfather's farm, uh, That's and crazy. my grand my grandfather had raised goats um, from the Depression. He started raising them during the Depression for meat, and you know went to World War II, came back, but he always raised goats, and they were meat goats. Um, and I've just recently learned that the average lifespan of a goat is 14 years. Um, and I think these are 15. And so they are the longest. Still going, still strong? Yeah, they're healthy. They're, I mean, they're not going anywhere. Right. And uh, uh, they're the longest living goats that have ever existed on my grandfather's farm. So That's I great. All the other goats refer to them as the immortals. And they're like. No oh, milk, big. right? You don't get milk from them, nah, do you? No. No. I, I never bred them, so they're just you know two nannies, two female goats. They just yeah. help keep that area clear of uh, uh, too much brush and right. You know, basically, the lawnmowers back there. Do they eat the bamboo? That's they the do. neighbor's yard, right? Yes, they don't. Uh, if I cut the canes down, they'll like strip the leaves. They love the leaves, but you know they don't eat woody stuff. But uh, right. uh, privet, wisteria, poison ivy, all that. They're all over it. They're all over it. Oh, yeah. Incredible animals. For sure. But Dave, I Thank love you, you brother. So much, brother. I love you, yeah. too. Thanks for having uh, me on. We'll do it again, and absolutely. we'll do stuff in person soon. Yes, absolutely. Must. Take care, my brother. Thank you, sir. All right, man. Be good.